Okay, so it is my great pleasure to welcome Holden Lee um, to give the uh, One World Seminar on the Mathematics of Machine Learning today. Uh, Holden is a postdoc at Duke University and before going to Duke, he obtained his PhD at Princeton where he was advised by Sanjay Farora. And he's going to talk about provable algorithms for sampling non mock concave distributions. And um, if you've uh, got questions during the talk, one of Holden's collaborators, Andrei Rostesky, is going to be in the chat. And he's going to answer questions. And um, you can ask questions during, or you can ask questions at the end. And uh, thank you, Holden, please. OK, so thanks for inviting me to speak at the One World Seminar. Today, I'll talk about provable algorithms for sampling non-log concave distributions. This covers joint work with Ron Ge, also at Duke, and Andre Risteski at CMU. I'll explain everything in due time, but to start off, I want to make an analogy between optimization and sampling. Recently, there's been a lot of progress in understanding optimization beyond convexity. However, optimization is only one of the basic algorithmic primitives in machine learning. Another important one is sampling, which is especially important for inference. Uh, similarly to optimization, the analog of uh, convex optimization is log concave sampling. Uh, and it's also difficult to move beyond uh, the law concave case. And uh, uh, law concavity, uh, like convex functions, fails to uh, capture many uh, real world problems. So it can't model features like multimodality, manifold structure, and so on. In this talk, I'll work towards a theory of non law concave sampling. Here's an outline. I'll first introduce the problem of sampling, why do we care, and build on this analogy with optimization. I'll introduce the basic algorithm for sampling called Langevin Monte Carlo, which you can think of as an analog of gradient descent. I'll go over the theory that's known, um, how it applies for log concave distributions, and uh, the challenges in going beyond log concave distributions. Next, I'll go through our results, uh, how we use simulated tempering for, uh, to sample from multimodal distributions, and uh, focus in particular on our uh, new uh, theory with Markov process decomposition theorems. Uh, finally, I'll go over some open problems and recent progress, uh, hoping to get towards more realistic models. So first, uh, sampling problem in its abstract form is as follows. We want to sample from a distribution P of X proportional to E to the minus F of X over R to the D, given black box access to F and the gradient of F. Uh, because we only require black box access, uh, F could be a complicated function, uh, even one that's computed by a deep neural network. Uh, here, f is the potential or the energy function, and you can think of it as a negative log likelihood. Uh, this is an important primitive in probabilistic modeling. It's used in posterior inference uh, when we want to know what the distribution of the parameters of a model are given observations, or to find the distribution of latent variables. Uh, so uh, find a distribution of a latent variable z given some observed variable y. In both cases, by Bayes' rule, this distribution is only specified up to a normalization constant. Uh, the, this is this integral. So we must implicitly solve a counting problem. And often, uh, evaluating this integral is as difficult as the sampling problem itself. Uh, I'll note that um, classical theoretical computer science, people also care about this problem for discrete spaces, such as the uh, Boolean hypercube. In this talk, however, I will focus on the continuous case. Okay, so I want to go in depth into an uh, important uh, class of probabilistic models where we can apply this to. Uh, 
uh, these are latent variable models. Uh, this is, these are models where the observations have some simple structure condition on some latent or hidden variables. And there's two tasks in machine learning that we're interested in here. One is posterior inference. We want to know the distribution of the parameters of the model given our observations y. And another is uh, inference for the latent variables to find the distribution of the hidden variables given observations. So some examples. One example is a Gaussian mixture model. Here, the parameters are the means and variances of the Gaussians in the mixture, as well as their proportions. The latent variable is the clustering, so which points uh, belong to which clusters. And the observations are the points themselves, um, but without knowing which cluster they came from. Another example is topic models important in natural language processing. Uh, here we assume that uh, a generative model for words in a document, uh, where a document is some mixture of topics such as science or entertainment, um, and each topic comes with a dis uh, probability distribution of words. Uh, the parameters here are the word distributions of the topics. Uh, the latent variable here is the topic proportions within a document. Uh, so that's what we don't observe. And the observation is the actual words that are in the document. Uh, another example, which I won't go uh, in, is community detection. Okay, so now that we've seen, uh, set up the sampling problem, I want to go more in depth into the analogy between optimization and sampling. The optimization problem is to find the minimum of a function f of x, and the sampling problem is to sample from a, a probability distribution proportional to e to the minus f of x. If we consider the same f for both, function, for both problems, um, and optimization here, the values of f correspond to the modes or the peaks of p. Uh, note that uh, one important difference is that in optimization, we only care to get to the minimum, while in sampling, we want to explore the entire distribution with the correct probabilities. Uh, the classic regime for optimization is convex optimization. In this case, we know there's one uh, local min, which is also the global min, and gradient descent finds it efficiently. Uh, the analog for sampling is log and cave distributions. Here, an analogous algorithm based on Langevin diffusion allows efficient sampling. Uh, but many real world problems are non convex or non log concave. And the non convex case, uh, there could be uh, many bad local minimum, so the optimization problem could be NP-hard in general. Uh, but still, in many cases, uh, gradient descent works remarkably well. Uh, similarly, uh, for non-log concave distributions, the distribution could be multimodal, and the problem could be sharp P-hard in general. Um, Logimin diffusion could take exponential time, but there's uh, practical, there's temperature heuristics and other uh, practical tricks that can make this uh, uh, problem practically tractable. Uh, so, so recently there's been a good amount of work in uh, adding some structural assumptions that make uh, the analysis of some non-convex problems tractable. Um, but the field for non-law concave sampling is still uh, in its infancy. And that's the case that we'll consider in this talk. Okay, so next, uh, before I go into non log and cave sampling, I have to uh, describe the algorithm Langevin Monte Carlo that works in the log concave case. So, Langevin Monte Carlo is based on a framework called Markov Chain Monte Carlo, uh, where we want to sample from a probability distribution, and we do this by following a carefully designed random walk on the state space. So we designed this random walk such that the stationary or the limiting distribution is the distribution we want to sample from. 
Uh, we say that the swap mixes when we get close to the stationary distribution. Rapid, rapid mixing means we get there quickly so that we get an efficient sampling algorithm. Okay, the MCMC method we consider is based on Langevin diffusion, a continuous time random walk for sampling from P of X proportional to E to the minus F of X, given access to the gradient of the log PDF uh, app. It's, uh, it's defined by the stochastic differential equation, which is gradient flow plus Brownian motion noise. It's a fundamental result that the stationary measure of this process is exactly the distribution we want, P of X. Since we care about algorithms, we have to discretize this process. Uh, when we do that, we get uh, gradient descent, or uh, we take a gradient step with some step size data, uh, but we also add noise, Gaussian noise scaled by square root two eta. Uh, so this noise, means that we don't converge to a minimum of our function f, uh, but that we converge to a stationary distribution instead. Uh, this noise also allows us to jump between shallow valleys of f. Uh, and remember that these valleys of f correspond to these modes of the distribution p. Uh, just like gradient descent has many variants, uh, so does uh, Langevin. This is the unadjusted Langevin algorithm. But there's many variants, including Metropolis adjusted Langevin, underdamped Langevin, and Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. Next, I'll go over the theory for Langevin Monte Carlo, uh, concentrating on uh, how it works for a log concave case and what fails uh, in a non log concave case. The basic tool for proving mixing is what's called a Poincaré inequality, or equivalently a spectral gap. We say this Markov chain or process satisfies a Poincaré inequality with constant c, whereas spectral gap one over c, um, if for all functions g where it's defined, the variance of g with respect to the stationary distribution is bounded by this constant c uh, times the, uh, the Dirichlet form. Uh, and uh, discrete, in the case of a discrete Markov chain, this Dirichlet form is defined as the quadratic form defined by I minus A, where A is the transition matrix. Um, so uh, this, uh, this Poincaré inequality captures the spectral gap in A, the gap between the largest and second largest eigenvalue, uh, which we know determines the mixing of a discrete Markov chain. Uh, similarly, we have uh, for Langevin diffusion, um, we also have this inequality uh, implies mixing, but with a different uh, quadratic form here. That's the gradient of G squared uh, integrated with respect to the stationary measure. Um, this can be related to what's called an infinitesimal generator uh, to parallel the discrete case. The details won't be so important for our talk, but the key fact to remember is that a Poincaré inequality with constant c implies mixing in time on the order of c. More precisely, if, uh, if our distribution satisfies a Poincaré inequality with constant c, and pt is the distribution after running Langevin diffusion for time t, uh, then the, uh, the chi-square divergence between pt and the stationary distribution p uh, decreases exponentially in time. And the uh, time for it to, uh, to decrease by a constant factor is uh, on the order of c. I'll note that this uh, chi-square divergence bounds the TV distance squared, and that stronger, in a stronger guarantees and KL divergence are possible with a, another functional inequality called the log Sobolev inequality. Okay, so let's look at Langevin diffusion for log concave distributions. Uh, so uh, for the continuous process, so let's suppose our distribution is alpha strongly log concave. Uh, this means that 
uh, f here is alpha strongly convex, uh, then uh, by the classical theory due to Bakri and Emery, uh, this distribution satisfies a Poincaré and log Sobolev inequality with constant L. Uh, so, um, or sorry, this should be a one over alpha. Uh, so then this gives a mixing time uh, as we saw on the order of uh, one over alpha. Since we care about uh, discretization, since we care about algorithms, we have to discretize this process. Uh, so recently, there's been a lot of work on discretization error bounds in various metrics. Uh, and they show that we can get approximate samples in polynomial time. So this was started by Dalalian uh, and Dumu and Moline and uh, continued by many others with better bounds. Uh, I also note that you can get improved dependence on things like the dimension and condition numbers uh, with other variants under damped, Langevin, Metropolis adjusted, and Hamilton and Monte Carlo. So what about for non-log concave distributions? The starting point is to note that uh, we have robustness under L infinity perturbation. So uh, suppose that our P of X satisfies a Poincaré or log Sobolev inequality with constant C. And the distribution we want to sample from is actually E to the negative G, uh, where F and G uh, differ in L infinity distance by delta. Uh, then this distribution, E to the minus G, satisfies the inequality with constant C times E to the two delta. And uh, recent work by Ivan Paula and Wimbisono have also shown that discretization arguments work in this regime as well. Uh, so important example here is that this shows that we can tolerate non-law concavity in a small region. So if our distribution is alpha strongly law concave, except in a region of radius r, uh, then this, uh, this constant here multiplies by something that's exponential in R squared. Uh, so we can only tolerate non-log concavity in a very small region uh, uh, without suffering an exponential um, constant here. So a natural question to ask here is what about more global deviations from log concavity? Well, we can't hope for uh, you know, we, we can't hope for something good in general uh, because uh, Langevin diffusion actually fails to mix rapidly for a very simple example. And that's the example of well-separated Gaussians. So here uh, is a mixture of two Gaussians uh, and a potential function here f is a double well potential. Uh, for this distribution, for Langevin diffusion, uh, uh, the theory of metastability due to Bouvier, Eckhoff, Gerard, and Klein shows that transitioning from one peak to another takes exponential time. And the transition is exponential in the energy barrier you have to cross uh, between these two uh, minima of f. And for Gaussians separated by 2r, this, uh, this energy barrier is r squared over 2. And so the, the mixing time is going to be at least exponential. Moreover, this is not an artificial example, but it's one that comes up in practice, for example, in clustering problems. Um, consider the example of a Gaussian mixture posterior, where we see points from a mixture of Gaussians, and we want to infer the means. Uh, now here's two uh, sets of means <laughs> that we could hypothesize. And note that to get from one configuration to the other, one of these means has to move from this cluster to this other cluster and pass through an area of low probability. Uh, so this means that there's a natural energy barrier for this problem. And uh, indeed, work has shown that uh, there's lower bounds for another Markov chain for this problem. Okay, so what can we do in this case for these simple multimodal distributions? Uh, so next I'll show our results 
explain how we can solve this, uh, this problem with simulated tempering. So the problem that we consider is that we suppose we want to sample from a mixture of Gaussians. Uh, so given black box access to the, uh, the log PDF, so F and the gradient of F, uh, where F is this uh, log PDF of this mixture of Gaussians. So we consider this problem because it's some sense the simplest multimodal distribution. As we just saw, Langevin Monte Carlo fails uh, for this distribution. Uh, so this can serve as a good test bed for algorithms that attempt to address uh, multimodality. In fact, we can ask for something more general. Uh, so suppose we want to sample from a mixture of log concave distributions. So here, this is a fixed, strongly log concave distribution. And uh, we can also allow L infinity perturbation uh, by some small amount delta. Our main theorem, so this is joint work with Wang Ge and Andre Wisdesky, is that an algorithm based on Langevin diffusion and simulated tempering runs in time polynomial in all the parameters as one over the minimum weight, the dimension D, condition numbers, uh, one over epsilon, and returns sample from a distribution P tilde uh, that's close in TV distance to uh, P. And it's also a robust to small L infinity perturbation delta. Uh, so I'll sketch a proof of our theorem uh, but I'll concentrate on the case where, uh, where the distribution is a mixture of Gaussians, uh, though uh, the same proof works for more general uh, mixtures of log concave distributions. Okay, so the new ingredient in our, uh, our theorem is this thing called simulated tempering, uh, which, are, which is uh, of a class of techniques called temperature heuristics. So the idea behind temperature heuristics is that we want to combine Markov processes, in this case, Langevin diffusions, at different temperatures in order to speed up mixing. So the distribution we want to sample from is e to the minus f of x, which I've drawn here. Um, and we consider the same distribution at a higher temperature. This means the distribution e to the minus beta uh, f of x. And this has the uh, effect of flattening out uh, this distribution here. Here, beta is some number less than one. Of, uh, beta is the inverse temperature of parameter. So we know Langevin diffusion will mix rapidly on this flattened out distribution. Um, however, this is not the distribution we want to actually sample from. Uh, so we have to somehow combine these two distributions in a clever way uh, to do our sample. Uh, so there's uh, many different uh, the, of these temperature-based algorithms, including simulated tempering, parallel tempering, sequential Monte Carlo, annealed importance sampling, and others. Um, and previous theoretical results uh, have been limited. In our case, they give uh, exponential dependence on the number of components. And this is due to Woodard, Schmidler, and Hoover in 2009. The algorithm we'll focus on here is simulated tempering. Okay, so let's define the simulated tempering process uh, formally, uh, combining it with Langevin diffusion. So this is a Markov process over a larger state space. Uh, that's the product of R to the D, our original state space, with a grid of temperatures. Uh, so that means that uh, uh, our, one of a state in the Markov chain is some point I X, where I is some temperature, and then X is a point in R to the D. So there's two types of moves in this uh, Markov process. So first, we can evolve according to Langevin. Uh, at the current temperature. Uh, so since, uh, uh, so in, in this case, that, be, that amounts to running Langevin 
but with uh, f replaced by beta i times f, where beta i is the i inverse temperature. The second type of move that we can make is that we can propose a swap uh, to some uh, adjacent temperature with uh, exponential rate lambda. Uh, so in this case, we accept the swap uh, with probability equal to uh, this metropolis hastings acceptance ratio, which is the ratio between the probability, uh, uh, the probability distribution at the new temperature and at the old temperature. Okay, so what's the basic idea behind why simulated tempering works? Um, so as we saw, uh, Langevin diffusion, and in fact, any Markov process with local moves uh, will get stuck in a local mode. But by creating this lifted Markov process, um, which changes this temperature, the simulated tempering process, we can exponentially speed up mixing because uh, the point can now move to a higher temperature, move across the space and explore the other modes. In order to make this process, uh, this picture rigorous, uh, we need what's known as a Markov chain decomposition theorem. So I'll first present the original Markov chain decomposition theorem due to Madras and Randall uh, in 2002. Uh, the idea is that we want to prove mixing for a Markov chain, and we do so by partitioning the state space into some sets, A1 through AM. Uh, so if we can show that M mixes rapidly when restricted to each set of this partition, um, and the projected Markov chain mixes rapidly, that is, it mixes rapidly between the sets, uh, then our original Markov chain mixes rapidly. Here, the projected Markov chain is, uh, is defined as follows. Uh, we shrink each of these sets to a single node, and, uh, and the transitions in this projected chain is the average probability flow between the sets in the original chain. The way we quantify this is by a gap related uh, inequality relating the spectral gaps of M with the projected and the restricted chains. So let's try to use this Markov decomposition theorem in our, uh, our example. So remember, our state space for simulated tempering is R to the D uh, times a grid of temperatures. Now, our distribution looks like a mixture of Gaussians at each level. We need to divide into sets where the Markov process mixes rapidly. Uh, so we can attempt to do this by, uh, by sort of marking off the areas around each of the Gaussians and letting that be one of the sets uh, in our partition. And hope that it looks enough like a Gaussian on each of the sets uh, to have a, a mixing by the classical theory. Next, we also need mixing between sets on the projected Markov process. So if we treat each of these sets as a single node, uh, we have probability flow between nodes uh, corresponding to the, uh, the sets that are in, uh, that are corresponding sets at adjacent temperatures because of the simulated tempering move. And we also have flow between the sets at the uh, highest temperature uh, because the, because Langevin diffusion mixes well at the highest temperature. And now in this uh, projected process, we see that we also have rapid mixing because we can move from any node to any other node by moving through the highest temperature. There is, however, one problem with this picture and that it's hard to divide into sets where, the, where Langevin mixes rapidly. Um, this is because if we have an arbitrary mixture of Gaussians, they can overlap in some pretty messy ways. Uh, so it's not clear how to find a, uh, a cle clean partition of them. Our insight is that we can work with distributions rather than sets. So instead of decomposing the state space, uh, into disjoint sets, uh, what we can do is decompose the stationary distribution 
as a mixture. So you can think of this as a soft partition of the space. And for us, this is especially convenient since we assume that our uh, distribution P is exactly a mixture of lock and cave or Gaussian uh, distributions. Uh, so for Langevin diffusion, this corresponds to decomposing Langevin diffusion on the mixture into Langevin diffusion on the components of the mixture. We can see this on the level of the Dirichlet form, uh, where we decompose the Dirichlet form into the sum of the, uh, Wj, the weights, times the Dirichlet form on the components. Uh, so, uh, so in order to prove our theorem, we develop this soft decomposition theorem. I'll state it for the simulated tempering process with Langevin diffusion but it works more generally for, uh, for Markov processes. So we decompose the um, Markov process at each level i. Uh, so this means decomposing the stationary distributions uh, and decomposing the uh, Dirichlet form. And note that there's two indices here because, uh, for, because we, the i here specifies the temperature and the J here specifies the component within the temperature. Uh, so those, these are all the component Gaussians that are uh, drawn in this picture. So if Langevin for each Pij mixes rapidly and the uh, projected Markov process mixes rapidly, uh, then the entire simulated tempering process mixes rapidly. Uh, here, the projected Markov process is defined slightly differently. Uh, we define it as having probability flow uh, between distributions that are in the same or adjacent temperatures that have large overlap with each other. And we quantify this uh, by an inequality involving the Poincaré constant. So the Poincaré constant of the simulated tempering chain is at most the product is at most on the order of the product of the Poincaré constant for the projected and the restricted chains. Okay, so with this, uh, with this modified theorem, we can now have a revised proof. Um, so instead of dividing into sets of a partition, we can divide into mixture components where the Markov process mixes rapidly. And here we, uh, in our mixture of Gaussian case, we divide into the component Gaussians. And we have mixing for each component by the classical vacuum emery theory for law of concave distributions. Uh, we also need mixing between sets on the projected Markov process. And the one requirement we need for this is that there is enough overlap between the distribution at uh, adjacent temperatures uh, so that there's probability flow between them. And there is enough overlap when the temperatures increase at a rate of uh, 1 plus 1 over square root d. Uh, uh, and this requires on the order of square root d levels. And then we get mixing on the whole space. Okay, so this, uh, this shows the, our theorem uh, for uh, uh, simulated tempering and Langevin diffusion that uh, gives an uh, efficient algorithm. A natural question to ask is what about how does this compare to other temperature heuristics? So as we saw, simulated tempering is only one of these many different algorithms. Uh, they fall into two, two broad categories. One is uh, for combining temperatures. Uh, where, uh, so we define some kind of Markov process on a long space. Um, so for simulated tempering, we had one particle that can uh, change in temperature. While in parallel tempering, we maintain one particle at each of the temperatures instead. And here, the, the swap move is now instead we swap two particles that are at adjacent temperatures. Uh, one downside of using simulated tempering is that it requires estimating normalizing constants. Uh, 
uh, we do this in our algorithm, but it adds a factor uh, to our running time. Whereas the nice thing about parallel tempering is that it doesn't require uh, estimating the constants. And this is because in the Metropolis Hastings uh, ratio here, the normalizing constant actually cancels out. There's also non-reversible or accelerated versions of these uh, algorithms. Another class uh, depends on just changing the temperature uh, in one direction. So this is the idea behind sequential Monte Carlo, also called particle filtering. So this is where we start with particles at the highest temperature. And when we decrease the temperature, we resample uh, or make the particles reproduce. Uh, and the particles that are at low probability will die out. Uh, so this allows it to adapt to the new distribution and we do this until we get to the one we want. So our, our framework give, can give a way to study and compare uh, these different algorithms. Uh, so the framework that I propose is that we can use a decomposition theorem to reduce uh, the problem to a discrete or projected process uh, with some number of levels, and we can study mixing on the discrete process. So uh, for simulated tempering, the mixing time for this process is on the order of L squared. Uh, this is because if you have L levels and a random walk, then to get from the lowest to the highest level, uh, you will need on the order of L squared steps. This means, however, that the time for getting one sample is actually L cubed uh, because we only because we can only accept the samples that are at the uh, lowest level or the lowest temperature. Uh, there is a heuristically parallel tempering could reduce this by a factor of L uh, by running the um, L different particles in parallel. So it's an open question to complete this table and compare these different methods. In particular, it's uh, interesting to consider what the effect of acceleration or non-reversibility is. And it's also interesting to get lower bounds for this one. Finally, I want to talk about some more open problems and recent progress. So we've seen a very simple multimodal uh, model, but how can we move towards more realistic models? The overarching question uh, we want to answer is that we, can, we want to show we can sample from natural, statistically meaningful families of non-log concave distributions in polynomial time. Two examples I'll focus on here are Gaussian mixture posteriors and matrix factorization posteriors. And though these models are quite fundamental, they already present significant uh, challenges, as we'll see. Uh, so first, consider the simplest Gaussian mixture model. Uh, so we have a mixture of two Gaussians with unit variance in D dimensions and say the means of the Gaussians are negatives of each other. Uh, and we generate observations from this mixture, and, uh, but we don't know which, uh, which component, which Gaussian these observations came from. And the task is to sample from the posterior distribution of the mean mu given the observations xi. By Bayes' rule, we know that this is proportional to the probability of the observations given the mean mu uh, times the prior. And we can expand, we can write this as a product because uh, each point has a one half chance of coming from either of the components. And we can evaluate this uh, efficiently. However, if we attempt to expand this out, we get a mixture of exponentially many Gaussians, uh, which is not covered by the theory uh, that we developed. So recent work by Wenlong Mo et al. showed that there is a random walk the, uh, that can sample on the power posterior in polynomial time. And uh, however, it's not the actual posterior, it's the posterior raised to a uh, 
raised to a power that's on the order of one over square root n d. So this is a weaker result than the one we would like. Their idea is also to use a um, what I call process, uh, use a decomposition theorem, uh, where the set state they uh, decompose into are now the hyperplanes perpendicular to the direction of mu. Um, and they show that you have fixing restricted to these hyperplanes, um, as well as on the marginal distribution, so you're mixing between uh, the hyperplanes once you add a reflection. A natural question here is to is how can we sample uh, with uh, with with uh, with beta equals one, so from the actual posterior. Okay, the second open problem is uh, low rank matrix factorization. So in this model, we assume that we observe a low rank matrix plus noise, where this low rank matrix is X, X transpose, where X is a tall skinny matrix, and we have Gaussian noise. The problem is the sample from the posterior distribution of X uh, given A, uh, we know by base rule this is proportional to e to the minus beta over 2 norm of x, x transpose minus a squared uh, times the prior. And the challenge here is a different one, uh, that we have manifold structure in this distribution. So the distribution is preserved under replacing x by x times u, where u is orthogonal. Um, and as you can see from this picture, this rotational symmetry uh, means this uh, this problem is definitely not uh, log concave. Uh, a recent theorem by Ankar Moitra and Andrei Rusteski showed that for uniform prior and large enough beta, uh, Langevin Monte Carlo gives an epsilon approximate sample in polynomial time. Uh, and the idea here is also to use a decomposition theorem, but a manifold version. So in this simple picture, you can think of the, so the, they use the, they decompose into level sets of the distribution. And in this very simple picture, these level sets would be the uh, circles. Uh, they also show a similar result for matrix sensing and completion. The main downside of this theorem is that uh, the for large enough beta, so that means low enough temperature or low enough noise. Uh, that's the regime where the distribution is sharply peaked. Um, and in a completely different direction, uh, so in a, uh, this is ongoing work with Franco, uh, Jen Feng Lu, and Andre Risteski, uh, we consider the rank one case of this problem. Uh, this is already an interesting uh, distribution. It's uh, restricted to the sphere. It's called the Bingham distribution in statistics. Uh, so we show there's an algorithm to sample in polynomial time uh, without any requirement on this uh, temperature. The idea here is completely different. We show that there's a way to explicitly approximate the marginal distributions of the uh, coordinates. Uh, using some clever polynomial approximations, and we can sample coordinates one at a time. However, this leaves open the question of whether a generic algorithm like Langevin could work on this problem, and what happens for higher dimensions and uh, any temperature. Now that brings me to the conclusion of the talk. Uh, in summary, I introduced non-log concave sampling as the analog of non-convex optimization. Uh, this is a very nascent field, so there's significant challenges and opportunities uh, for theoretical work here. I argue that we need new algorithmic tools as well as new methods of analysis. So as we saw, there's these temperature heuristics that could be very useful, uh, and these uh, decomposition theorems uh, have appeared in multiple places um, in these works. Uh, there's many open questions remaining. Uh, in particular, how can we establish polynomial time mixing for simple families 
of non-log complete distributions. Okay, so um, thank you for your attention and I'm now happy to take questions. So thank you very much for this lovely talk. Um, I'll allow people to unmute themselves and ask questions now. Um, but uh, before, uh, while that happens, um, I've got a question uh, about uh, understanding. And I think I might have missed that, but um, so you're considering these Gaussian mixture models and the number of different temperatures that you need depends only on the square root of the dimension. Yes. Um, does it depend, uh, so it is universal uh, in the number of Gaussians that you mix and in the, in the relative size of the variances and means and the mixing parameters? Uh, so we do, so our theorem requires that the variances of the Gaussians be the same. Okay. Um, here, so yeah, so the, the variance has to be fixed. Um, and there is dependence on the mixing time on the number of comp, number of Gaussians. Uh, this indirectly is here through one over W min, uh, because if you have a mixture, if you have an equal mixture of K Gaussians, um, then W min would be one over K. Yes. Okay, I, th I see, thank you. Does anybody else have a question? Okay. If that's not the case, I'll uh, ask one more thing because you did mention um, in Metropolis Hastings, usually you've got this normalizing factor where the normalizing fa constant cancels out and that is no longer the case here. So how expensive is it to calculate that? Yeah, so the, the way that we do it to get a provable algorithm here is that we essentially have to rerun the whole process L times, where L is the number of temperatures. Um, and this is because we have to, uh, so uh, once we have a sample from one temperature, we can uh, calculate, we can, we can approximate the normalizing constant for the next temperature. Um, so uh, naively, what you would have to do is run it on every initial segment of temperatures from the highest temperature. So that requires rerunning the whole process L times. Uh, now there's more, there's I guess more ways to do it in practice where you might do something adaptive or on the fly. Um, uh, but uh, those things haven't been uh, analyzed theoretically. I see. So, are there any other questions or comments from the audience? Because otherwise, I would say thank you so much for the talk, Holden. And um, the next One World Seminar is next Wednesday at the usual time. And I hope to see you all there again. Bye-bye.